Hi everyone. So in today's lecture, we are going to start lecture one. Basically, this video lecture will cover lecture one PowerPoint slides as well as chapter one of your book. So this is the very beginning of your um, economics uh, class. Uh, it will start with the very basics and from here on it will build on. You know, so chapter one is more of a basics. Uh, last class in lecture zero, I gave you a brief idea of what economics means. In this lecture, we will move a little bit further, um, uh, start to build the block of economics as well as look into different types of macroeconomic objectives and macroeconomic concepts. So last class, we learned that economics is basically it's a study that helps us to make the correct choices. Um, again, from uh, based on last class, we know that the resources um, are very limited in quantity. Uh, there is a finite number of, let's say, steel, a finite number of workers, or a finite number of um, gold in this uh, in this world. But as humans, our wants are limited. So since there is a gap between our wants and the resources, we have to make um, proper allocation of resources, and in that means we have to make choices. And we will make that choice that will ultimately maximize our satisfaction or in economics we will say that will maximize our utility and ultimately achieve economic efficiency. Now this is again based on what we discussed last class. Okay, so economics is basically the study of the allocation of resources that brings maximum utility to people and at the same time we achieve economic efficiency in the economy. Okay, we also discussed that there are two branches of economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. So microeconomics is at the individual level. It, um, it, it relates to the allocation of resources by, you know, by you, by you, me, um, uh, by, you know, by, let's say, Tom, by, uh, by a business. So basically, it's a perspective from a smaller unit and it includes consumers, businesses or small, you know, uh, entities. Okay. Whereas my macroeconomics, which is this, uh, you know, macroeconomics deals with the study of the allocation of resources within a society. OK, so how resources are allocated in the Dallas economy or how resources are allocated in the Texas economy or in the U.S. economy. When we are looking into that, that is called macroeconomics. So it is at an aggregate level or at a group level. Micro is at an individual level. That's the basic difference between the two. But ultimately, the main objective of both these studies is to maximize consumer satisfaction or maximize our satisfaction and at the same time maintain economic efficiency okay so then uh, the book or the chapter talks about a concept called the principles of economics so the principle of economics what it means that these are the generally accepted concepts and theories that relate to the overall allocation of resources so when we are trying to allocate and distribute the resources there is a set um, a set group of theories and concepts out there that we use to allocate these resources okay and those set theories concepts and beliefs are known as the principles of economics now how did we get this set of um, uh, concepts and theories how did we arrive to these set of uh, concepts and theories. Basically, these were um, created or we were able to obtain these by making observations of, of human behaviors, like how we will react under certain situations. So, you know, different situations were created and how humans will behave um, over and over and, you know, as they people want to maximize their one and meet their needs. Okay, so that's where we got these observations so based on these observations we came up with the concepts and theory uh, the, so the observations came from human behaviors that occur over and over as people try to meet their needs and wants so let's say for it during the rainy weather we will always use an umbrella when we go outside that is uh, it, it has always been observed that when, during the rainy seasons when there is rain people will use umbrella and that's why people will use umbrella during rainy season so that's an example or that's an observation. And based on that, uh, there is a generally accepted concept and theories were developed. So basically the pattern of the human behavior to distribution of resources is study, studied to give us a framework for the principles of economy. 
Okay, so hopefully that's clear what it means. Basically, we observe humans, how they behave under certain circumstances over and over again. And based on that behavior, we developed the generally accepted concepts and theories. And then we apply those to allocate resources in the society. Okay, then we have another concept called policy economics. Policy economics is more of a uh, a policy economics is more of a macroeconomics concept. Okay, so it refers to the application of the principles of, eco of principles of economics when a government is trying to come up or implement a policy in order to achieve an efficient and growing economy and at the same time equitable and fair. So what it means is basically this is at the macro level. Okay. So when the government is trying to implement a policy that will affect thousands and millions of people in the economy. Uh, they are using the principles of economics, just what we learned. They are using those principles of economics to implement the policy so that we there is an efficient and growing economy and at the same time, there is an equitable and fair economy. So it is fair to everyone. Not only a group of people is making money and the remaining are in poverty, but everyone is benefited. So it's equitable and fair and at the same time, it helps, to, uh, uh, it helps the economy to grow. So that is policy economy. So now examples of policy economics will include, you know, if we are setting the income tax rate. Let's say when the government is setting the income tax rate, it will affect many people. Um, and they have to set it in a way that is fair, equitable to everyone. And it also brings growth in the economy. Okay, then setting interest rate, then government expenditure, whether government should build highways or not, whether government should make investments or not. These are all types of government expenditures. Okay, and we're going to learn about it later in the class. But all these fall under policy economics. Okay, so now we look into four different types of analytical tools. These are very, very important. These tools will come back in all the chapters we go along. As we go along, you will see that the building blocks for the material that we cover in the other chapters are these four concepts. So we basically have to be very um, you know, clear on these concepts and we have to understand what these means. So the four types of analysis are rational analysis, marginal analysis, opportunity cost analysis, and variable analysis. So first, we will discuss about rational analysis. So, um, you know, we know that resources are limited and we have to make choices. So when we are used, when we are trying to understand the rational analysis concept, what it means is we are trying to use logical thinking and the number of analytical tools when we are making a decision or when we are making a choice out of all the um, options available to us. So the assumption is people will think rationally and they will make rational choices by being able to understand what their need is. Okay. Now, if let's say if I have $50 and um, I haven't had food for a long time uh, and my options are that I can go to a concert, I can buy a meal or I can buy a laptop, then definitely I, as a rational human being, I will buy the meal. Okay. Because, um, that is a rational choice because I haven't eaten for a long time. So that is what rational analysis means. It means that when people are making choices, they will use logical thinking and they will make decisions based on rational uh, thinking. Okay. So when they are making choices, people will consider and will understand the benefits, the cost, the risk and uncertainties associated with each choice and the choice that will give them the most benefit and will uh, and has the lowest cost, risk and uncertainty, they will only select that cost because that makes uh, rational uh, sense, right? So uh, people will only make that choice that will give them the maximum or highest amount of personal utility. Uh, again, for instance, it is a rational choice to buy raincoat during rainy season. Okay, you will not buy a raincoat um, in, during winter season. Okay, so that's not rational. So it's it's very simple. It's very easy to understand that people, when they are making choices, they will be rational and they will apply their logical sense to make decisions. Okay, so the next one is marginal analysis. What it means is we compare the inputs versus output while we are making an action. So when making a decision about a new choice, so make sure you understand marginal is all about a new choice, not your existing choice. When you're trying to make a new choice, 
then the marginal analysis comes into play. So, you know, a rational person will compare the marginal cost to the marginal benefit and then decide whether he will make that choice or not. Okay, so let's say I have 10 pens now, okay, and then I want to buy one additional pen. So, whether I should buy that one additional pen or not, I will compare the marginal cost of that one additional pen to the marginal benefit of that margin of that one additional pen and if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost only then I will buy the pen if the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost I will not buy the uh, 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 11th pen okay so it's the marginal cost is basically the additional cost that arises from making one additional choice okay um, and then marginal benefit or marginal utility so they are they can be used interchangeably it's the additional benefit that you get by making one additional choice okay so I, I just want to do a quick example so it is very clear to you guys so let's say again you have 10 pens right now okay and you want to decide whether you want to buy the 11th pen whether you should buy the 11th pen okay now the cost of this in a 11th pen just by this itself is let's say two dollars and the benefit that you will receive from this one pen from 10 to 11 is one pen is let's say one dollar so in this case the marginal benefit is one dollar and marginal cost is two dollars so, so your cost is greater than your marginal benefit and you will not buy the 11th pen okay so that's an example where how we use marginal analysis to make a decision to make a decision about a new choice okay let's say we have three cars whether should we should buy another car or not we will compare the marginal cost and marginal benefit of that fourth additional car and then make our decisions okay so hope that's clear to you guys now I will move on and do another example. Actually, before the example, I wanted to clear some concepts with you guys, which is listed in your slide is, you know, again, the benefit of an action is called utility or the satisfaction that you get from an action is called the utility. Okay. Now there are two types of utility, marginal utility or marginal benefit. And the other one is total utility. Total utility is basically the total amount of satisfaction that you get from all your choices. Now, when you are buying the 10 pens and let's say you get $20 uh, in benefit, that is your to $20 is basically your total benefit from the 10 pens. So that's your total utility. Whereas marginal utility is the additional benefit that you will get when you buy one additional or when you make one additional choice. So in case of the previous example, if you go back, if you're trying to buy the one additional pen, the extra benefit that you were going to get is one dollar. So that's marginal benefit. OK, so understand the difference between total utility and marginal utility. Total utility is the satisfaction that you get from all your choices. So you will add up all the benefits. OK, and marginal utility is basically the benefit that you get or the additional benefit that you obtain by making one additional choice. OK, so it's the addition now. Okay, the formula for marginal cost is given by change in cost divided by change in units. I want to do an example so you understand how marginal cost plays an important role. Okay, um, let me um, do it in this board. Okay, so let's say you're given with a shoe factory. Okay, so let's say there is a shoe factory. Now, currently this shoe factory Okay, currently let's say they produce current number of shoes they produce is let's say 1000 shoes. Okay, so currently they are producing 1000 shoes and let's say the cost to produce this 1000 shoes cost to of production for this 1000 shoes is 125,000. So in order to produce 1000 shoes the factory will incur 125,000 okay now assume the 
let's say the research and development team of this shoe factory go, does some research in the market and finds out that there is more demand for the shoes so the factory should increase their production so based on that research let's say in, in the future okay they will produce 100 and uh, they will produce 2000 shoes okay so let's assume based on the feedback of the research and development team uh, the team uh, the production team decides that they will now produce instead of thousand shoes they will produce two thousand shoes and the cost to produce these two thousand shoes is now hundred and seventy five thousand okay so this information is given to you okay based on this information I can ask what is the average cost currently and what will be the average cost in the future and what is the marginal cost okay again I want to write down the questions so you understand okay so based on this information I'm gonna ask what is the average cost now and and in future and what is the marginal cost marginal cost is again what is the cost of one additional unit okay when you're producing one additional unit what is the cost of that okay so first let's scroll down and do the first one average cost right now average cost right now is basically the total cost right now is 125,000 the total cost divided by total quantity right now we are producing 1,000 shoes so the average cost is hundred and twenty five dollars so what this means what this number means is basically to produce one shoe it costs one twenty five dollars therefore to produce thousand shoes it costs it costs hundred and twenty five thousand dollars okay so this average cost is basically the cost of producing one shoe um, out of these thousand shoes okay now in the future when we are going to produce two thousand shoes what is the average cost at that time let's say average cost in future we know it's going to be the cost will be 175,000 divided by total shoes we will produce is 2,000 in the future we are producing 2,000 shoes so the average cost right in here will be 87.5 now notice here as you are producing more units your cost per unit is going down correct because average cost here was higher whereas when you're producing 2000 shoes your average cost per unit is going down from 125 it fell to 87.5 so it's probably more efficient right your cost is going down as you are producing more so that's average cost okay well it will happen most of the time but sometimes it can go up but most of the time when you produce more output your cost per unit will go down which is good which is a sign of efficiency in terms of the producer okay so that's the answer for the first part average cost now which is $125 and average cost in future which is equals to average cost in future is 87.5 okay now my next question is what is your marginal cost now go back to the slide what is the formula for marginal cost change in cost divided by change in units so our cost what is the change in cost 175,000 minus 125,000 divided by 2,000 minus 1,000 okay so that is equals to 50,000 divided by 1000 which is $50 okay now what does this $50 means this $50 means is after the 1000th shoe after this 1000th shoe the additional cost that you will incur to produce one additional shoe is $50 so from 1001 to the 2000 shoe each shoe will cost $50 okay that's the additional cost per unit so 
after one thousand dollars your each the cost to produce each shoe is fifty dollars now whether this firm should take up this decision or not depends on the marginal benefit here we don't have any information about marginal utility or marginal benefit if the marginal utility is greater than fifty dollars then yes the firm will produce more shoes if the marginal utility is less than fifty dollars then the firm will not produce um, uh, the shoes the additional thousand shoes so that's how we will calculate marginal cost average cost and you know that's very important because um, based on that we will make based on the marginal cost and marginal benefit we will decide whether to take up new choices or whether to take up new production or not okay so hopefully that's clear to you guys next we move on to opportunity cost analysis so, so this is another uh, type of analysis or concepts it is a little bit tricky sometimes i have seen students confuse it with marginal cost analysis so make sure you understand what it means what it means is you know as humans since resources are limited we have to make choices let's say we have three choices and then we have to make one choice because our resources are limited so opportunity cost is basically the benefit that i give up for the next best alternative let me show a simple example So let's say you have three choices, okay, for lunch today, pizza, Chinese, and burger, okay. From pizza, you will get a benefit of $10, assume, a benefit, not the cost. Assume this is your benefit, you will get $10 benefit. From Chinese, you will get $8 benefit, and from burger, you will get $6 benefit. So as a rational human being, you will choose pizza, correct? Because that gives you the most benefit. Again, this is benefit, not cost, okay? So pizza will give you the most benefit and you will probably, as a rational human being, choose pizza as your choice. So you are giving up Chinese and burger. So when we are talking about opportunity cost, opportunity cost is basically the benefit that you could have got if you did not choose pizza and it's coming from the next best alternative so out of these the the, the the two that you gave up which is the next best alternative definitely chinese right because it is eight dollar it will give you more benefit than the burger right so if you did not buy pizza you probably would have bought chinese right because it will give you eight dollar benefit versus six dollar benefits from burger right so in this case your opportunity cost is eight dollars okay so it is the benefit that you forego um, um, for the next best alternative choice that you had okay so hopefully this clears what what opportunity cost means okay so it is the loss of potential potential gain or utility from other choices when a certain action or choice is undertaken since you chose pizza pizza um, as your choice you have given up Chinese food and burger however what is the most benefit that you could have got if you did not select pizza it would have been from Chinese eight dollars right so that is your opportunity cost it is the value of the next highest valued alternative use of that resource right in this case which is the next highest valued resource this is the next highest valued resource so eight dollars is your opportunity cost you know every action we take has an opportunity cost let's say if we are going to a concert tomorrow today or tomorrow there is an opportunity cost we could have slept at that time we could have studied at that time we could have worked uh, during that time and earned extra income so every action we take there is an opportunity cost and the opportunity cost is basically uh, the loss of the gain or utility that we could have earned from the next best alternative choice okay um, so another formula that we need to know is total choice cost of a choice when we are making a choice in terms of economics we have to look into the opportunity cost as well so in general we will let's say if we are going to a concert our when we are looking at the total cost we will only think about the cost of the ticket and the cost of the transportation but when we are thinking in terms of economics the total cost of choice is all equal to all of your out-of-pocket expenses plus your opportunity cost okay 
So let's do this example. For instance, if you decide to go to a concert and the ticket price you have to pay is $50. So now you decide that you will go to a concert with your friends and the ticket price is $50. And then you will take an Uber to, to there and the cost of Uber is $5. Okay. And then you say that we, we are also given that also you could have earned, if you did not go to the concert, you could have earned $25 in these two hours. Okay. So basically we are saying if you decided not to go to the concert for two hours, you could have worked and earned $25. So based on this information, what is the total cost of the choice of going to concert? So let's go and do this example break this down break this example down so it's clear to you guys now we know what are the cost first cost is our ticket cost right so ticket cost is equals to fifty dollars and then we have transportation or let's say uber cost is given five dollars based on the slide okay so these two are your out-of-pocket expenses the in order to go to the concert you are spending these expenses okay now what is the benefit that you're giving up because in the in terms of economics the total cost is basically out of pocket expenses plus your opportunity cost now if you did not go to the concert you could have earned 25 dollars so your opportunity cost is basically 25 dollars right um, so if this is given what is your total cost? That's the question that I'm asking. Your total cost is your out-of-pocket expenses plus your opportunity cost. So out-of-pocket expenses is $50 ticket cost, $5 Uber or transportation cost, plus $25 is your opportunity cost or the uh, income that you're giving up or the benefit that you're giving up in order to go to the concert. So in total, it will be $80. That's your total cost. In, in general, we wouldn't have included this $25. We would have just taken out this $25 and your cost would be $55. But in economics, we have to include this $25 and that's how we get the total cost. Now, another thing we have to realize when we are doing opportunity costs is we have to know is resources are limited. So we have to make choices either this or that. We cannot get everything. Okay. So let's say with same resources, this is another example I'm doing for opportunity costs. Let's say with the same amount of resources, okay, US, the US as a country can either produce 25 tons of chicken, okay, or 50 tons of wheat. So this is an R situation, right? We, our resources are limited. So we cannot produce both at the same time. The US can either produce 25 tons of chicken for uh, consumers or 50 tons of wheat, okay? So if we decide, if US decides that they will produce 50 tons of wheat, what is the opportunity cost of producing one ton of wheat? That is a question I can ask, okay, given this information. So based on this information, in order to produce 50 tons of wheat, what are we giving up? We are, in order to produce this 50 tons of wheat, we are actually giving up 25 tons of chicken because this is an or, right? We can either produce this or that. So if we produce 50 tons of wheat, we are giving up 25 tons of chicken, okay? And then then in what is the opportunity cost of producing one unit of wheat so in order to produce one unit of wheat we are giving up 25 by 50 which is half a chicken so the opportunity cost to produce one ton of wheat is half chicken this is another way we can look into opportunity cost in the in the economy we cannot produce everything that's why we engage in trade and we will look into this in our next chapter but you have to understand that resources are limited. So we can either produce, let's say, cars, but we cannot produce trucks, or we can either produce trucks, or we cannot, but we cannot produce planes because resources are limited. And then we have to look at the opportunity cost based on each other products. Okay, so that's how we calculate opportunity cost. In this case, the, for one unit of to produce one unit of wheat, the opportunity cost is half ton of chicken. Okay. 
So moving on, the last one, the last type of analysis is called variable analysis. Variable analysis is basically we try to find out the relationship between two variables. And in this case, we have one is a dependent variable and one is an independent variable. OK, so dependent variable is a factor that depends on other factors. OK, it is a, it's a variable that depends on other factors and independent variable factor is or independent variable is a factor that is that is not dependent on anything okay so when we are looking into variable analysis a dependent factor can be affected by many several factors okay so one when we look into variable analysis we look into the effect of one independent variable to another to a dependent variable and we hold all the other independent variables constant okay and this is also known as ceteris paribus okay so i want to do an example i want to give a quick example so it is clear to you guys because i know in terms when we are when i'm using these terms it gets a little bit tricky but let me do a quick example so it's clear to you guys uh, So let's say here income, your income or your monthly income is a dependent factor. Income is dependent on a lot of factors, right? What you will earn will depend on a lot of factors. So this is a dependent factor. And a lot of independent factors that determine income are number one is your educational background, right? How much is your degree? Like if you have a bachelor's degree compared to a master's degree, you'll probably earn less if you have a master's degree you'll probably earn more so education affects your income then probably location will affect your income then probably experience will affect your income okay then probably age will affect your income okay so this this all these things experience education location age these are all independent factors and income is a dependent factor okay because income is dependent on all these factors now when we talk about variable analysis what we mean is we look at the effect of income and let's say in education we only look at the effect between education and income and we hold these all other factors constant so we will hold experience age and location constant and we will see how the income changes when education changes will the income go up when how will how will the income change when we move from associate's degree to bachelor's degree to master's degree to phd degree okay holding all other factors constant or we can also look at the impact of experience on income holding all the other factors constant that is called variable analysis so in this case we try to find out the relationship between one independent factor and a dependent factor holding all other factors constant it is also known as ceteris paribus. That is what is called a variable analysis. Okay, so what does positive economics mean? Positive economics means when it's the statement of facts or objective data. Okay, let's say I'm saying today the unemployment rate is 14%. That is positive economics. I am just stating a fact based on the information that we have. I'm just stating a fact. That is positive economics. Now, what is normative economics? Normative economics is a statement. It is an opinion about the economy, but based on facts. Okay. So you do not make any false claim. Whatever you are trying to say is based on facts. So that's normative economics. An example would be, you know, the unemployment rate has not risen more than 7.5 percent until 2019 because of government actions. This is a subjective opinion you're saying, but it is based on fact. It is reality that until 2020, the unemployment rate did not go up beyond 7.5 percent. So you are putting a subjective opinion, but your opinion is based on some facts. So that's normative economics. Usually normative economics will have the when, when there's a sentence the sentence will usually have the word ought to be or should be when you have these words those are usually normative economics okay another is called a biased opinion biased opinion is basically when you say something that does not have any economic merits. OK, you are just saying, you know, um, unemployed right now, unemployment rate is 14.5, but you're saying no unemployment rate is actually 4%. So that's a biased statement. There's no economic merits. There's no grounds to what you're saying. That is biased statements. OK, and finally, we have fallacy of composition. What this means is 
when um, it occurs, basically when when an individual, when something benefits an individual, that individual thinks that it will benefit the society as a whole also. So we are assuming that if something benefits me, it will benefit everyone else also. But it has, in reality, it's not true. So that's policy of composition. So let's say... Um, I live in a home and behind my home there is a creek, okay? And I trash or I dump my trash in the creek, okay? So if I just dump, dump my trash, it will probably not cause too much problem. But if all my neighbors and everyone in the neighborhood start dumping their trash in the creek, then it will create a lot of problems. It will create environmental issues. It will cause water blockage, right? So this is a type of policy of composition. When I am thinking that some, if something benefits me, I assume that it will benefit everyone else. So that's an example of policy of composition. Okay, then we, the final topic that is discussed in chapter one is called the circular flow model of economics. This is very important. It is the basic, very basic model that helps us to understand how the economy in general operates. Okay, it, this, this diagram or this graphical representation helps us to understand the relationship that exists between households and the business sector, you know, in, a, in an economy. So there's two groups in an economy, the households and the businesses um, in terms of goods and services, okay? So this diagram will help us to understand how the how is the relationship between the household and the uh, businesses, okay? Now, um, in a market system, in, in under a market-based system, it, we are not assuming other type of economy where government controls. We are assuming this is a free market like the U.S. The household owns the resources, okay? And there are four types of resources. I was talking about resources all this time. So what are these resources? There are four types of it. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, okay? We are going to talk in details about each of these resources in our next video lecture, which is in chapter two. But for now, you know, there are four resources, land, labor, capital and entrepreneur. And the, all these resources are owned by the households, us. We as households own these resources. OK, now we provide these resources to the businesses. The businesses then processes these resources to produce goods and services. OK, and these goods and services are then bought by us again. OK, now examples of goods. What are examples of goods? Goods would be cars. OK, goods would be TV, furniture, carpets, um, any type of grocery, gas. Uh, these are goods. OK, what about services? Goods are basically anything that's tangible. You can touch. That's good. What about services? Services are, you know, if I am providing you educational service, I'm providing you a course, that's a service, educational service, health care service, a child care services, auto repair services. So these are all types of services. OK, these are not usually tangibles. And in this circular flow model, we usually have two markets. One is the factor market and the other one is the product market. So I wanted to draw the graph. I wanted to draw this diagram so you, uh, so you understand what uh, how the economy operates and how the income and the goods flow over the through the economy. OK. So let's um, look it here. OK. So let's assume we start with households, which is us households and we own the resources. OK. Remember, that's what we said. We own the four types of resources, land, labor, capital, and in entrepreneurship. Now, we provide these resources to the businesses. On the other side of the cycle, we have businesses. So we are providing them the resources. And when we are providing them the resources, the businesses will pay us, right? Pay income. An example would be labor. I'm going to office and providing service and in, in return for my service, I get salary. So that would be an example of this. I'm providing my labor resource and in return, I'm getting income. OK, so households provide resources to businesses and in return, the businesses pay income to the households. OK, now when households get when businesses get these resources, they will process them and convert them to goods and services, which are again bought by the households okay so businesses will use let's say my expertise and then they will use natural resources such as oil or steel and then they, let's say they will make a car 
and then that car is a good that car is sold back to the households and when households buy these goods or services they pay the re they pay businesses okay which come back to the businesses as revenues okay so here this market is called product market because it is the it is where the final goods and services are sold to the households or consumer and this market is called the factor market because here the resources are sold resources are also known as factors of production remember this this we will tell a lot of times resources are also known as factors of production and based on that this is the market where factors of productions are transacted or are exchanged that's why it's called factor market and where goods and services are exchanged are called product markets so if you look at it here the income but the, the income that households receives from business for resources they use the same income to buy the goods and services and this money flows between households and income and also the goods and services and resources flows between the households and businesses so, so this is the circle of flow of income this is the very basic model now we are not considering a lot of things we are not considering trade here we are not con considering international trade we are not considering government here government can tax our income right so a lot of things are not included this is the very basic model for you to understand how households that own resources provided to the businesses businesses opt in factors of production and pay an income which goes to the household the businesses convert the factors of combine and convert the factors of production to final goods and services which are then bought by the same households and they pay for these goods and services which they come to the businesses as revenue so this is a circular flow if you see the income is going in a circular flow um, and it helps us to understand how the overall economy operates okay uh, so one thing we want to know is we need to know the different types of income that comes to the four different types of resources or four different types of factors of production so for land people who own land or land holders the income they earn is called rent okay for labor um, the income they earn is called salary or wages you know when we are going to work the service we provide in return we get salary or wages if we own a land and if we rent it out the income we get is called rent capital holders money or any type of machine we have if we give that in return we get the income we get on that is called interest and for entrepreneurs who start business for them the income is called profit so you must know for landholders it's rent for labor it's wages for capital holders it's interest and for entrepreneurs it's profit and the starting point of a circular flow of income is the entrepreneur so entrepreneur is the most highly valued factor of production this is important you have to know out of the four factors of production entrepreneurship is the most highly valued um, factors of production and it is the starting point of the circle of law. It is an entrepreneur who starts a business and starts acquiring resources from a household. And that's how the circle of law of income starts. Okay. So you have to know this. So entrepreneur is something that will start the circle of flow of income. I just realized that, you know, although we, we were at the end of the lecture, I just realized that I skipped three uh, three slides of the lecture so I wanted to go back quickly and cover those materials because it's important because it's related to the goals of microeconomics um, you know by now we know what microeconomics is and you know this is the principles of microeconomics class so we as students of this class and as the teacher um, you know we have to know what are the goals of microeconomics so that when we are studying the materials further we can understand and we can relate to them okay so Again, microeconomics is at the individual level. We look at the consumers, we look at the business units, right? So there are economic goals for individual business firms, you know, firms such as Walmart or firms such as Samsung, they have economic goals. And similarly, we as consumers, when we go to a market to buy something, we also have goals. We have some economic goals. So for business firms, the main goal is to make profit, okay? And that is the fundamental reason for the existence of a firm we go and do a business just to make money to make profit right if we are making losses there's no reason for us to be in business right and similarly if you compare any other business walmart they are in business 
because they want to make money they want to make profit if they have been making losses they wouldn't want to be in the business so the fundamental economic goal for a business unit is to basically earn profit okay but there are many other goals as well and that's what we're going to look into when we are looking into microeconomics okay so for firms so we will split split the goals into two parts microeconomic goals of business firms and then we will look into microeconomic goals of consumers okay but microeconomic goals for business firms such as walmart number one is profit again that is the fundamental reason even if you meet all the other goals and if you are not making profit there's no reason for you to be in the business so profit is the most important uh, microeconomic goal for a firm you know when they are doing business that's what the number one reason number two growth over the years they want to make a growth so they can make more money right if they are stagnant and if they are making the same amount of the money that's not what everyone wishes everyone wants to go to a bigger house everyone wants to buy better cars right and in order to do that we need to have a growth in profit so the second goal is growth the third microeconomic goal for a business unit is consumer satisfaction so they have to make sure Sure that the consumers are happy with their services and happy with their good, goods and services okay why is this important this is important because if consumers let's say they come to Walmart and they're not happy with the, the service of the customer service of the uh, retail um, then they will just switch to other uh, substitutes such as they will go to Tom Thumb or they will go to Target so in that way, over the years, Walmart will be losing customers so they have to make sure they provide the highest um, type of customer service so that consumer satisfaction is maximized okay so the third goal is consumer satisfaction fourth is employee managers stockholders and bondholders interest or welfare so, so the company itself has a lot of other components like you know they have employees they have managers they have shareholders who invested in the company and they also have banks who have given loans to this business right so they have to keep in mind and work accordingly what does the bank want the bank wants to make sure they receive the payment for the loans on a, in a timely manner so they may they have to make sure they pay payments on a timely manner what do the shareholder wants shareholder wants to receive um, as much payback as possible what do the employees want employees want good pay and good um, you know uh, work environment so all these things also have to be in, taken into consideration as a microeconomic goals when we are thinking from the firm's point of view and finally government and moral responsibilities that's the final goal uh, for e business units that's because you know government sometimes put restrictions that you cannot release hazardous materials um, into the road or into the lake and you have some moral responsibilities and some ethical uh, duties towards the citizens of the country so, so you have to make sure you are fulfilling those and you're not um, and you're abiding by the laws and you're not um, you know just not following the law Okay, so these are the microeconomic goals for a firm. Okay, now we're going to look at the microeconomic goals for consumers. So that's us when we are going to the market, uh, when we are going to the grocery store to purchase things. What are our microeconomic goals? First one is again, we want to maximize our satisfaction. Remember, even in the last class and even in this beginning of the class, I said, you know, in, in economics is a study of making choices, and we make choices because resources are limited and then we want to make that choice that will give us the maximum satisfaction that is the ultimate goal for any individual or any consumer so first is maximize consumer satisfaction second is value added every time we buy additional quantity that must add value to uh, to us you know there has to be some value if the cost is greater than the value we will not buy it right if marginal cost is greater than your marginal benefit we will not buy that good okay so there has to be value added and finally we want to reduce the cost we want to pay as much less price as possible for a good right as consumers we want to buy the we want to pay the least price for a good or services so that's another goal so three goals maximize our satisfaction we want to make sure there is value added when we are making a choice and we want to reduce the cost or pay the lowest possible price so I missed these three slides so I wanted to go over these and cover them quickly because in the exam I might ask you questions what are the microeconomic goals and you have to know what are the microeconomic goals for a firm and what are the microeconomic goals for a consumer okay with that I am going to finish this lecture this covers your chapter one and um, you know after this in the next class 
I will basically give you another vid video lecture that will cover lecture two. Okay. Until then, you guys stay safe. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.